you join me today at the wheel of the new Suzuki Swace, a Toyota sourced hybrid estate car, something very new for Suzuki. Is it any good? Well, let's find out. Hello, welcome to Furious Driving, and this big chunk of metallic mica blue loveliness is the new 2021 Suzuki Swace. Now, if you watch this channel, you may well know that I am a big fan of Suzuki and their products, but they are more known for things like small cars and city cars and four-wheel drives, fun cars, really. So if you think Suzuki, you generally jump straight to things like the Swift Sport and the Jimny. Yeah, you know, the fun stuff. So finding them offering a big family practical estate car is a little bit unusual, but not necessarily a bad thing. As you may also be aware, Suzuki and Toyota now have a product alliance. They're working together to develop new cars in different areas, both taking advantage of the other one's uh, expertise in, in differing fields. Suzuki, in this case, are taking advantage of the Corolla and the fact that Toyota have got 23 years of making hybrids ever since the first Prius came out all that time ago. Can you really believe that's 23 years we've been mocking the Prius? So let's take a walk around this car and see what we think of it. Now, from the front wheels back, very little has changed from the Toyota body shell. In fact, virtually nothing, if I'm perfectly honest. But that's not a bad thing because it's a good looking car. It's got classic estate car proportions. So a wide, low body. It's practical and it's nicely proportioned, which is all good. Come around the front though, and we've got the Suzuki family face. Uh, different headlights, different grille, this big hexagonal pattern in these black plastic areas and the radiator grille itself. There are two trim levels, SZT, which this car is, and SZ5, which is the top of the range thing. Uh, the SZ5 gets LED lights, which this one only gets standard. Now this is the important part of this car. This is what separates it from the rest of the uh, mid-size hatchback and uh, estate crowd. And that is, of course, why Suzuki wants to be working with Toyota, whereas Toyota get access to Suzuki's small car know-how, of which they are absolute masters. Suzuki get access to two decades of product development in hybrid technology, and so this car is one of the best hybrids around. Now, what we're looking at here is a 1.8-litre four-cylinder petrol engine, which develops 102 PS. And attached to that is a generator, which can generate electricity from that engine, and there's an electric motor in there somewhere as well, which develops 53 kilowatts, which is about 71 horsepower. And it's all very cleverly managed to always try and use electricity as much as possible and petrol for generating power or propulsion as and when it's needed. But for a lot of the time, it is actually electric. And this means your WLTP figures for this car are 64.2 miles to the gallon and only 99 grams of CO2 per kilometer, which makes it very, very efficient. And I have to say, I've done about 100 miles in it so far and I've been hitting the low 60s, 62-ish most of the time. And that's a lot of country and town driving. Now around the back of the car, the styling so sharp you could cut yourself continues. These heavily sculpted uh, tail lights look absolutely fantastic. It does of course have the blacked out tailgate and the blacked out side windows at the back as well, which adds to the drama, mystique and the overall cool look of the car. And there are lots of nice sharp angles and things all over the place, giving it plenty of visual interest. Uh, notably, this tailgate is actually made of composite, which makes it even lighter and helps with the economy of miles to the gallon. Now, here is something which is very good. This is an estate car, not an SUV. <laughs> because this is an estate car, we've got easy, low access into the boot of the car. We've got a nice big boot that goes on a long way because SUVs are inevitably very short booted. They're very tall booted, but short booted. Your boot becomes a well in an SUV. Unless you've got heavy things that are solid and you can pile things on top of each other, it's completely rubbish and you waste most of your space. An estate car has got a ton of room in here. This also has a split level floor thingamajig. So this floor panel lifts out and you can either set it at load lip height. So you can load big, heavy items in here. If you want to go picnicking, it's comfy. If you want to stick a washing machine in there, not a problem as long as the washing machine is smaller than the size of this. Alternatively, if you want more space, you can drop it down there so you've got another well, eight or so centimetres of height into the boot area. And underneath here, we do not have a spare wheel or anything like that, which is always a shame. I will say this until I'm blue in the face. Please give us space saver spare wheels. I know it adds 0.1 of a gram of carbon or whatever in terms of your WLTP figures, but I'd rather do that than be stuck on the side of a motorway or up a mountain with no means of getting home because I've never had a, a puncture that I could repair with the goo. And I'll say this in every review I ever do when I find a car hasn't got a spare wheel. However, this does give you an absolute ton of space. And also, of course, if you want to set your boot to that height, then you do have a big 
hidey hole that you can hide secure things secretly underneath there. You've got big cubby stashes on either side, so you want to put things in that don't want to roll around. They can live in the boxes at the edge. You've got a low space cover, which clicks out to here. And of course, because that only comes to there because of the angle, the other half of it is up here in the tailgate. Very clever. We also have fold down seats. And to use that, we have handles on the side for ultimate ease of use. It's a 60-40 split as things often are these days. And they fold completely flat so your stuff can go miles and miles over there. And let's not also forget, we have got curry hooks for hanging your takeaway and lash down points so you can chain stuff down if you want to. With the seats down, the load space is 1860 millimeters long, which I'm going to define as precisely very long. It's also 1430 millimeters wide at the opening and 850 millimeters tall. With the seats up, it has 596 liters of space, and with the seats down, 1606 liters of luggage space. Wow. There is a courtesy light and a power outlet back here. Right, let's take a look around the interior of this thing. So first of all, we have got some rather comfortable sculpted seats with this very interesting uh, star design, three-pointed star design. I don't know what that reminds me of. But that's in all the, uh, all the major seat fabrics. And the seats are manually adjustable for height, rake, distance, but electrically adjustable for lumbar, which is interesting. This protrudes a little bit as you climb in, but I've not knocked myself on it as I have done on some cars in the past. Now we have got a lot of stuff on this car. I think I'll talk you through some of it here where we're sitting in it and some of it where we're driving. Let's have a quick look around. First of all, now starting over on the door with a sculpted line which carries on into the dashboard, this little point. The dashboard is heavily, I'm gonna say sculpted again, heavily sculpted um, so it carries on through here, disappears into there, drops down here, then rises up again, first of all with that sharp point of the dash, and then secondly with a stitched line here as well. Crikey, it started and surprised me. And the stitch line does carry on all the way down to here. Now back over in the door we have a large, it's an enormous, uh, I think they feel like some kind of cast metal, or metal coated at least, door handles. They feel quite strong. Big chunky door locks, below which are many, many buttons. We've got four electric windows, central locking, mirror fold function, and of course electric mirror adjust. Beneath that a massive door pocket which has got a front section designed for a bottle and a big loudspeaker down there of course. Moving up to the dashboard we have got a quite curious vent shaping and let's probably take a moment to talk about the, uh, the design style choices. We have got what could be quite a dark cabin because everything is black or dark grey in here, but there's enough changes of uh, a material and uh, surface to make it actually quite interesting. So we've got the textured elephant hide here, we've got a lighter rubbery leatherette type feel uh, on top of the dashboard, more rubber than leatherette I would say, but it's quite soft touch and spongy which is nice. Then we have the satin chrome lines which outlines the air vents, the uh, instruments and goes all the way across the dial and it's leather area here which feels you know obviously like a fake vegan leather in the middle here i guess this covers the airbag and then piano black we've got piano black strip here across the middle piano black on the audio uh, infotainment area and around these controls which with the power off disappears to blackness which is kind of cool um okay so yes let's get back to what we were talking about and this big air vent here it's big and chucks a lot of air out. You've also got another small one going up onto the front tiny quarter light type window here, which is an unusual feature these days. It doesn't open, obviously. Uh, two more big vents in the center and another massive vent over on the far left-hand side. But beneath this uh, Cadillac bumper tip from the 50s, we've got a little row of hidden buttons, which have a few things. The uh, headlamps are not self-leveling on this one because it's standard headlights. The SZ5 does have self-leveling headlights. Automatic headlights, which have got auto high beam as well, if you leave that in high beam mode, uh, something that's not there. All of the cars come with heated steering wheels. Heated seats and heated steering wheels are quite an impressive feature at this price point. Rear window wiper, traction control off. I call it stability control, but it says traction control when you push the button. Then moving up here, we've got our ordinary standard controls for 
lights and indicators, wipers and so forth on the right hand side. Then we get to the steering wheel which is leather, it's quite nice, big and not really soft, soft, but comfortable to hold, uh, heated as I just said, but so many buttons you need to take a minute and sit down and investigate this before you drive off otherwise you'll be absolutely lost hunting for whatever button you're looking for. So we've got the volume control, speaking commands, uh, phone, like a joy pad wheel on the left hand side, uh, cruise control on the right hand side, and some actually quite advanced settings here. This is the uh, simple park assist, and this looks like the um, accident avoidance. Now we're sitting here, the ignition is on, the horn button is waiting to be pushed. That's, that's not an exciting horn. Sorry Suzuki, this is a fail of the horn test. Now looking back up ahead, we have got quite the instrument panel. Now this is a semi-digital screen. You'll notice on the left and right we've got actual physical needles for the rev counter, for the fuel gauge and for the temperature gauge, but this speedo in the middle and all that screen area in the middle of it is actually completely digital. It's all screen, so uh, that's quite unusual. Um, a combination, a hybrid dashboard and a hybrid car. Well, I suppose it's fairly fitting really, isn't it? It is nice and clear. We'll talk about some of the features that are involved in that when we're actually out on the on a drive. Before this disappears, I will quickly mention you do have your airbag warning, which vanishes into darkness in this piano black area. It's hiding a little light. That's quite fun. Now moving back, of course, we have our infotainment. Now this is great. It's an eight-inch full-color screen. It's high resolution, very very clear and easy to see, and you've got a nice angle. Uh, Nice range of angles, you can see it from as well. You can sort of look all the way from the left to right in the back of the car. It's, it's easy to see wherever you're sitting. Um, and even better than that, we've got physical buttons on either side of it, which is fabulous. So you can go home menu, um, set up, I quite like watching the info, so I can see what the car's doing. And of course, this car has got Android Auto and CarPlay. So this is great, it is a touch screen, but also you do have the physical buttons, physical volume, physical tune scroll, so you can flick between radio stations. Um, and you've got big air vents, as I mentioned. Hazard lights in the middle on a nice little uh, lozenge-shaped thing, like a, a cushion-cut diamond of a hazard light warning button. Uh, then you have your dual zone climate um, with all the other various controls. Now, interestingly, your heated rear window switch is also your heated mirror switch. I was going to think there weren't any heated mirrors, but they are just there. As you step down below this, we have a large cradle area, which is just the right size for your phone, either that way or that way. And there's a hidden USB um, plug. There are two USB plugs in the front, but this is the one you need to use if you want to use CarPlay or Android Auto. On either side of this, there are a pair of high low setting front heated seats so this is good though i have found a couple of times dropping your phone in there you can actually set your heated seat on without really noticing and a few minutes later you wonder why you're so warm but it's just because you nudged it with your phone now moving back we've got uh the gear selector area and the drive selector area first of all we've got the drive mode select uh, we've got sport normal and eco modes and full EV mode, which means the car will stay fully electric as long as it can. So if you're leaving very early in the morning, driving in a zero emission zone, you can force the car to remain in that. Now, sadly, of course, it is an automatic, uh, pretty much all hybrids and it's EV cars of every description are just going this way because they kind of have to be because of the weirdness of the transmission, which is sad. This is kind of the one thing I dislike about uh, the future is the lack of, of manual options on these things these days. Uh, we do have the usual park reverse neutral drive and a brake mode so if you are traveling down a steep hill you can have this in b mode and get some engine braking which is a nice option to have uh, you have hill hold assist and an auto handbrake and then important consumer information check out these cup holders they are absolutely fantastic they are deep and they are wide enough to take most cups and no matter how hard you're cornering you're not going to lose your drink out of that so you can be fully prepared for extensive tea shelfery of the highest magnitude this is awesome this is uh, one of the many reasons i like suzuki cars not just because they're reliable not just because they're fun not just because everything about them is is nice and endearing it's because they take care of the details like having somewhere to put your coffee when you're out on a drive now inside this armrest there is a big cubby hole it's a little carpety bit at the bottom so you don't scratch your glasses there is a regular standard uh, 12 volt cigarette lighter style socket and just a basic usb outlet but that one doesn't car play there is a mahoosive glove box down here and up in the top a little unusual we've got an sos button so if you do get into trouble you can hit that and help hopefully will come 
now we have the back seat. Now climbing in, it's not bad access as me just leaping into the car. I've got, from my standard driving position, we've got decent leg room, decent knee room. Okay, foot room's a little bit tight on my toes. Um, that front seat is pushed very far back, so it's a bit tight, that's a bit unfair. Interestingly, only one map pocket behind the passenger seat. We do have air vents, but no power outlets that I can see. The extent of our door cubberiness is a slanted bottle holder. So you can put a drinks bottle with a lid on it in here, but you can't put a tear of coffee in there because that will absolutely spill. You will need to be pouring it directly in there and drinking with a straw if you want a hot beverage in the back of the car. Uh, we have got hidden in the darkness of this black headlining, so quite cool sports car-like uh, affectation. Uh, grab handles and coat hooks on both sides. Big bright double lamps. The roof line does come down quite sharply, so it's a little bit tight on your head sitting here in the back. If this was a family car, for example, you'd have kids back here, not adults, and there'd be an absolute ton of room. It's not claustrophobic, but if you were three adults in here and you were maybe six foot or above, you would definitely notice that, that headroom, and this does drop down quite hard on the door aperture. And finally, we do have an armrest which does have some proper cup holders. So if there's any two of you in the back, you can have a, uh, your Costa or your Starbucks in here. So setting off in the Swace is a silent and magical affair. The car is now running and ready to go. Pull away and the car will start in full electric. And continue to be full electric up to some miles an hour. I haven't quite worked out what the full limit of the electric speed is because on the motorway earlier today, it was actually driving at 50 miles an hour in the roadworks on full electric for quite some time. So the hybrid system is pretty clever. There is a petrol motor which will sometimes drive the car, only very occasionally. Sometimes it will drive the generator and charge the battery and drive the motor at the same time. Sometimes the motor will drive on its own and sometimes it'll be a combination of all the above. So yes, very clever, very inventive. And of course, to make that happen, it goes through an automatic gearbox, but not just a regular automatic gearbox, a CVT, continuously variable transmission, which I imagine is because all those different inputs need something fairly variable. CVTs are remarkable in their smoothness. However, they do drive a bit like the old fashioned slush boxes rather than the modern DSG kind of things. So if you're after a more dynamic feeling car, this may not be quite right for you. Now, as I mentioned in the interior walk around, we have got this mode selector button. So we can go from eco mode, which puts the car in as much of a power saving mode as possible, softens your driving inputs and runs it on battery as long as it can. Then we've got normal mode, which is for everyday driving. It's a good compromise between battery power and petrol power. So we've just uh, kicked in with a slight bit of engine assistance right now. And then we've got sporting mode, which uh, livens things up considerably, makes the car feel a bit more exciting on the road. But for a lot of the time, I will just leave it in eco, I've found, because the drive is more than acceptable and it does make you feel like you're saving you a bit of fuel. Too many cars, it seems, these days are built for dynamic ability rather than passenger comfort. And this does not seem to be one of them. This is very much geared towards a comfortable, relaxing ride. Now, something I have found about this car over the last few days is how relaxing it is to drive. The suspension is relatively soft and uh, the slosh box handling of the gearbox does mean it is sifting through the gears rather than shunting through them, so you drift up to speed. Low speed acceleration is quite dramatic, but then you get to higher speeds and it takes a little longer at the top end to gain velocity. And so you do tend to find yourself driving in a more relaxed manner in this car. It's not something that feels like it wants to be hustled along and doesn't necessarily reward you for that either. Now driving around a city like Cambridge with speed cameras everywhere and the many, many average speed checks I've had on the way here today, you will be very glad to see it posts up the speed limit that you should be driving at on the uh, dials, which means you've no excuse for drifting over the limit. So I hope I haven't today without realizing it. Realistically, the economy I've been getting has been high 50s. It's settled down to 55 now after a bit of stop start. But generally, it comes fairly close to the uh, low 60s claim. Now, it's more than a little likely that a car like this will be spending a fair degree of time 
on the motorway. So let's head on to the M11 and see what it's like. Now, as seems to be the way of motorways in Britain at the moment, I'm in a 50 mile an hour speed controlled area, likely with uh, average speed check cameras coming any second now. So I have got two options here. I've got the speed limit, so I can't accelerate beyond the point I've set, or I've got cruise control with radar cruise assist, so that it will uh, follow the car in front at whatever speed has been set. We're now in a 50 mile an hour average speed check and I've set the cruise control. Now the car is now using a bit of petrol and a little bit of electric, but I suspect that as we move along in a minute or two, it will kill the petrol motor and just be living on battery for, a, for quite a while actually. Okay, here's a, a good example of acceleration from 50 up to 70. There we go, that's 70 miles an hour. It accelerates fairly briskly, but you get a strange sensation from the gearbox. The CVT is a strange thing to get used to. As you accelerate it, it does pick up speed reasonably briskly, but the, the changes don't seem to bear any correlation to what the car is actually doing on the road. It's, it's quite strange. The engine note doesn't necessarily match whether the car is accelerating or not. It's slightly odd, but that's partly due to the hybrid system as well. On the motorway, the car is stable, it's quiet, the radio is fantastic, the car play works faultlessly, so it will read you your text messages, answer phone calls should they come in, and of course navigate through your phone. The screen is big and bright and clear, it is vaguely distracting watching what the battery is doing, but you can turn it off and go onto your navigation if you want to. Forward visibility is fantastic, you've got a great big windscreen, the A posts disappear out of your vision fairly well and don't block too much, and there's little uh, quarter light windows in the corners, I mean you've got a lovely view beyond the corner of the dashboard. Looking over your shoulder, the way that the waist of the car rises up does mean it's a little awkward seeing in the rear, furthest rear corner, but you do have a reversing camera so you can see what's going on from that. Now the Suzuki Swayze is built alongside the Corolla it's based on at Berniston in D-Side in Britain by Toyota for Suzuki. And in fact the uh, hybrid powertrain is also sourced in the UK. So it's nice to know that if you're buying this car in Britain, you are buying something that has not travelled a long way around the world on a cargo ship before you set foot in it. Now, there are only two trim levels of this car, the SVT we're sitting in now and the SVZ which is a little more highly spec'd. And there's not a lot of price difference between the two. This one is £27,499 and the upper SZ5 is £29,299. Now what you get for your money is pretty impressive even in the base model. Now the equipment levels on these things are more than generous. I mean everything gets the big screen, automatic high beam headlights, road sign assist so you can tell what speed you're going into displayed in the uh, speedometer, dynamic radar cruise control, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, electric heated door mirrors that fold in when you lock the car, DAB radio, an 8 inch touchscreen, Bluetooth built into the head unit and outside there's roof rails. Move up to the SZ5 and you can start getting things like a simple intelligent parking assist, blind spot monitor and of course artificial leather seats. Lane keeping assist but under a different name but I have to say it's definitely one of the better systems I've come across because I have not felt it intrude once in well, the several hundred miles I've now driven the car, including a fair bit of motorway. And the thing about Suzuki is it's a strange sort of company that engenders a certain amount of warmth and friendliness towards the brand. And it's kind of strange to say about a, uh, a giant multinational corporation, but they do have a bit of a, a family feel about them. So you really aren't getting short shrift whichever one you choose. There's other clever little things as well. In order to conserve energy and get better economy, the uh, air vents will sense what seats are being sat in. And even though it's dual zone climate, it will shut down zones of the climate control that no one is using. So it's not gonna waste any time heating or cooling the passenger seat as no one sat there today. And there are just little things you notice and appreciate, like in this armrest, you've got a USB and a 12 volt socket. So you're gonna have wires trailing out of there. So. So they've put two little indents down here so your wires can actually come out and not stop the lid closing properly. It's the little details that really matter in a car. 
The interior feels really nice. Everything is relatively soft touch, even the hard touch plastics are quite soft. And this door is lovely and padded, so you can rest your elbow on there. This is nice and padded, so you, you can do a fairly long drive like I have today and still get out feeling absolutely fine and rested. The steering wheel, the padding, it does feel a little bit hard to me, if I'm honest. Um, the heating on it is so effective, it actually almost hurts. You have to turn it off after a fairly short time because it heats the wheel up so quickly, I found very early this morning. Everything feels very solid to the touch. All the shiny piano black stuff does look good, but it does collect dust incredibly fast. And I do think it looks absolutely fantastic in this color, which is called mica or metallic mica blue. It really does sparkle in the sunshine. If I was gonna buy one of these myself, this is absolutely the color I would go for. So thank you for joining me today in the Suzuki Swayze. Is it a good car? Yes, yes it definitely is. It's based on what was already a good car, so it was never really gonna be anything but. It's comfortable, it's refined, it's got great range, and knowing what Toyota and Suzuki are like, you can guarantee it's gonna be reliable. If you've enjoyed this, please do hit like and subscribe. Follow me on Mondays for more Modern Monday new car reviews and Friday for retro reviews and in the rest of the week for everything else. See you again soon driving something completely different.